Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. And uh, give us a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And become one of our friends on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Well, today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all of your support. And now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, the Celia Woodstock Matter. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Is this Mr. Dollar, the insurance gentleman? That's right. Well, this is Captain Lyle Woodstock. I was given a message that you telephoned. Oh, yes, I did. Your insurance company wanted me to look into this trouble with your wife. Wonder when I could see you. At your convenience. But it's not trouble yet. It's quite possible that uh, nothing is wrong at all. Oh? Well, I understood that you were worried about her disappearance. That you hadn't heard from her in over a week. Isn't that it? Yes, but uh, I'll explain it all to you. But uh, as I said, in spite of her absence, it's entirely possible that uh, nothing is wrong at all. All right, Captain Woodstock. I'll be out to talk to you this afternoon. While we take a breather from our program, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you know who Uncle Sam's lawyer is? If your answer is the Attorney General, you're absolutely right. But being legal advisor to the President and other governmental agencies is only part of his job. His main task is running the Department of Justice, which makes sure that the laws passed by Congress are carried out and that lawyers are available when the government must be represented in court. Let me give you an example. Suppose there is some question concerning the amount or kind of tax you should pay, or suppose you and the government don't agree as to which of you own certain land. That's when the Department of Justice steps in to represent the government side of the case. If anyone is brought to trial for counterfeiting, smuggling, gold hoarding, or passport forging, the Department of Justice prosecutes the case. It also handles all matters dealing with legal immigration. And all of this activity is the responsibility of an important member of the President's Cabinet, the Attorney General just as it is the duty of the United States government to protect each and every one of you, it is the duty of the Attorney General to protect the government of the United States. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Celia Woodstock matter. Expense account item one, $25.50. Car rental and mileage to the Woodstock home off the highway just east of Bridgeport. There was a large frame house shuttered against the winter wind blowing across Long Island Sound. Captain Lyle Woodstock, please. Yes? You are Mr. Dollar? That's right. Come inside. Thanks. I am Captain Woodstock. It was nice of you to come out. Nasty wind, isn't it? Yeah, it wasn't blowing like this in Hartford. Quite often windy here on the Sound. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to leave your coat here. Well, that's all right. I discharged the servants, all of them. Couldn't stomach their attitude since Celia's departure. Come along. We'll talk in the library. Okay. After you, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. I'm afraid I was guilty of a certain amount of uh, deception when I spoke to your Mr. Miller. Uh, through a delicate choice of words, I'm afraid I intimated that I was 
frightened for seeing his very life. Uh, sit down. Well, why the deception? Why, naturally, to interest them in the situation. And with a purpose, Mr. Dollar. Uh, well, couldn't you afford to hire a private detective? My good man, I have wasted a considerable amount of money by doing just that. It was from the stumbling idiot of a detective that I received the news of Celia's disappearance. He was following her? He had been for a month until he lost her. I had entertained certain suspicions about Celia. What's this investigator's name? Uh, Slater. Mr. David Slater. He was recommended as the best in Bridgeport. Considering his dismal failure, you surely understand why I felt it necessary to turn to someone else. My insurance company struck me as a wise choice since there is a large policy on her life. All right, I'll talk to this Slater. Now, will you give me everything you can on your wife, description, and so on? Yes, of course. They're on the table. I brought out a few photos. Hmm. How old? Twenty-seven. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That one was snapped on Mondego Beach. Uh, very striking woman, isn't she? Yeah. And this one was taken while we were anchored off Hero last summer. You got around. Uh, travel has its uh, advantages, Mr. Donner. This your boat? Yes, in dry dock at the moment. As a matter of fact, I met Celia when I uh, put into Las Cruces instead of Acapulco. <laughs> and it seemed that she, too, wanted to travel. Where do you think she's traveling now? I haven't the faintest idea. As I started to tell you, I'd been troubled by a certain suspicions. She was seeing entirely too much of a young doctor in Bridgeport. His name is Masterson. Dr. Charles Masterson. You think he could have something to do with her disappearance? Is that what you mean? Uh, I shouldn't like to say. I believe that she is a quite perfect physical specimen, yet she visited this doctor fellow at least uh, three times per week. Yeah. Anything else? As a matter of fact, yes. We were in Acapulco two years ago when... The rest of the story wasn't too far from typical, although I don't meet too many of the breed. A, the 55-year-old Woodstock, captain because he owned a schooner, had dedicated his life to what he called adventure. And B, the 28-year-old Celia, had also dedicated her life to what she called adventure. The results were a number of voyages. And finally, Celia Woodstock's disappearance. I found the private investigator David Slater in a conservatively crummy suite of offices on Front Street in Bridgeport. Well, you've met him, so you know what type he is. Yes, I followed his wife. Well, what did she do? Got a report on every move she made for months. You want to see it? Not if you remember the highlights. Now, uh, what about this Dr. Charles Masterson? Well, doctors are hard to pin down, you know that. She went to his office three times a week, but uh, she never met him anyplace else. Maybe she was sick. Her husband says no. Well, I didn't find out. I couldn't have talked to the doctor without uh, letting out who I was. He had a nurse who quit the day before I left the case. You didn't talk to her? I was going to, but after I left, I didn't. <laughs> Why should I? Do you know who she is, where I can find her? Yes, her name is Janet Squire. She went to work in the Red Cross Blood Collection Center up on Union. Good, thanks. Now, uh, what about the day Mrs. Woodstock dropped out of sight? Was there anything special? I sure there was something special. I wouldn't have lost her. <laughs> I'm no rookie in this business. She bought a ticket to New York City on the 345. So did I. I got in the same car that she did. I didn't see her, but uh, I figured she was powdering her nose or something. When she didn't show before the train left, I went through the rest of the cars, but I uh, never picked her up after that. She knew you were tailing her, huh? Well, she must have. Once I got on the car and then right off. That and the money she drew out of the bank makes me think that she was running out on old Woodstock and nothing else. No money was mentioned to me. Well, that's funny. Woodstock knew about it. Two thousand dollars the morning she left. Huh. I wonder what else that old renegade is holding out on me. The phone calls she made? No, he didn't say anything about phone calls. She made quite a few from public booth. I finally got into one next to her. I, I couldn't get the number, but she she talked to somebody named Sprague. She didn't say much but uh, the name. And then asked, uh, where do you want me to meet you? And uh, when she was answered, she said, uh, all right, I'll let you know when everything is arranged. Well, that's all. Well, that's enough for me. If he thinks he's got a free wife chaser, he's mistaken. You're going to drop it? Sure, that's the way it is. I gave up that kind of work a long time ago. I don't like it. It's 
dollar, Captain. Get in and close the door. What's this? Where's Woodstock? Close the door. If you do anything else, I'll kill you. Where's Woodstock? He's gone. Now walk backwards. Down the hall. Why? Go on, or I'll shoot. Stop now and turn around. Open the door. And get in the closet. Now, wait a minute. Please, please, mister, do what I tell you. It won't make any difference if I kill you. Okay. Close it. When I heard the front door slam, I started kicking my way out. The paneling was heavy and it cost me a torn trouser leg and a scraped shin before I made it. Mrs. Woodstock. <laughs> Mrs. Woodstock. <laughs> Hello. He'd given himself some more time by pulling out the phone wires, but it took less than five minutes for me to cover some 200 yards to the nearest neighbor, explain myself, and get through to the Bridgeport police. A short time after that, I met Homicide Lieutenant Al Jester, and with him, watched two ambulance attendants start Mrs. Woodstock toward the hospital. Keep a What's the condition, boys? Can you tell? It's bad, Lieutenant. A right lung. Yeah, no chance of a statement. Huh? We'll do what we can, Lieutenant. Hold it, sir. Fine. I got Well, I guess it depends on her how easy or how hard this is going to be. Yeah, but better not count on it. I've been disappointed too often. Uh, how did Slater's story strike you? Well, I had no reason not to believe him. He said as far as he was concerned, the girl was running out on her husband. Mm. The more I saw of it, the more it looked that way to me, too. Then I came out here to drop the case, and it blew up in my face. Now, the man you described, could he have been the Sprague? Yeah, he could have. I didn't ask him. He was half crazy. If he was Sprague and I'd thrown the name at him, he'd have killed me. It was that bad. Yeah. Could you describe the gun? Yeah, it was a cheap revolver. Nickel plated with a short barrel. Caliber was thirty two. You sure of that? Oh, well, I guess a smart lawyer could keep me from swearing it was a thirty two, but it was. I'll take that. I got only one definite thing out of him. He said Woodstock was gone. That's all he'd say. Then he put me in the closet. I didn't hear him drive away. I was kicking up some noise getting through that door. But the people in the house where I phoned said they saw the car leave. It's the next house, that way. Oh, okay. Lieutenant Jester. Yeah. You better go upstairs. We're shooting up there, too. Where? In the hallway toward the back. There's no question about this one. He's dead. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? As a statesman, he showed great strength. He was a defender of religious liberty and continually attempted to strengthen the national unity of the state. He influenced the writing of our Constitution and with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay wrote the famous Federalist Papers, considered one of the best analyses of the Constitution. He ran for the first United States Senate but was defeated. Then he served an eight-year term as representative from Virginia. During the War of 1812, when the British attacked Washington, D.C., he and his wife were forced to flee for their lives. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During his administration, Louisiana and Indiana joined the Union. Who was he? James Madison, fourth president of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Right back there, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, I see him. 
Woodstock? Yeah, let me see. Yeah. That's who it is. Get some light on in the room, huh? Yes, sir. Shot from behind. There's a gun on the floor, Lieutenant. Yeah, that guy told you Woodstock was gone, brother. Well, he couldn't have been more right, could he? I guess not. Well, let's get out of here until the photographers show up. By the end of that first day, the description of the man I'd tangled with had been broadcast, along with a possible description of the car he was driving. Celia Woodstock hadn't died, but she hadn't regained consciousness either. I took a hotel room in Bridgeport that night, where I'd be called if and when anything happened. Nothing did. The next morning, I went to the Red Cross Blood Collection Center to talk with a nurse who had recently resigned from the office of Celia Woodstock's friend... And or a doctor. Mr. Clark and Mr. Yes, Gibson, ma'am. please. Yes, ma'am. May I see you, please? I'd come in with my mind tossing motives for murder around. <laughs> motives of personal <laughs> greed and selfishness and hate. And it was almost a shock to suddenly face a segment of this country, citizens, old ones, young ones, men and women, quietly going about the business of helping the best way they knew how. I stayed to give my own blood after Janet Squire talked with me. And I knew it would go out of the center in the best of company. You can go in here, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Squire, but I was told you were in Dr. Charles Masterson's office until a short time ago. Yes, that's right. I'm working with the police on a case. I'd like to learn as much as I can about Mrs. Woodstock. Well, I'm afraid I know very little. She was a patient of Dr. Masterson's, but other than that, I know nothing. Her husband seemed to have the idea that she might be more than just a patient. That there might have been romantic interest between them? Yeah. Was there? Not that I know of. I make it a point to do very little prying into other people's affairs, Mr. Dollar. Sometimes I wish I could. Do you know anything about anyone named Sprague? Sprague? No, I'm afraid I don't. I'm sorry. So am I. I uh, hope the results are better when you start working on me. A telephone check with Lieutenant Jester about an hour later added nothing. He'd been in communication with Mexican authorities, but they were unable to come up with any leads on Celia Woodstock or even any proof that she'd been in the Acapulco vicinity two years ago when Woodstock told me he had married her. Homicide men were searching the captain's schooner and they were still working on the name Sprague. I played my last card and went to see Dr. Masterson. I was shocked when I read about it. It's tragic. But, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you realize why my name mustn't be dragged into this. It won't be if it doesn't belong there, Doctor. Why, there was absolutely no basis for his suspicion. Whatever made him say anything like that? He had a detective following her. He had an idea that she came to your office too often. And why didn't he talk to her? He did. She said something about a sinus condition and heat treatments. That's precisely the truth. I resent your attitude, Mr. Dollar. Well, that puts us on a par. Your attitude doesn't set so well with me. Keeping your name out of this case isn't as important as clearing it up, no matter what you think. But I know nothing about it. Well, you must have talked to the woman. As often as she was here, you must have become fairly well acquainted. Well, no better acquainted than with most of my patients. I don't ask for any more. What did she talk about? Why, the conversations were unimportant. She talked about her travels. They'd come here from Florida to have some work done on their yacht. Did she talk about her husband? Yes, occasionally. General things. Never anything about unhappiness? About leaving him? No. They were planning on a trip to South America in a few months. Dr. Masterson, did she ever mention anyone named Sprague? Sprague? I... Well, this is one of the strangest things that's happened to me in a long time. Why? Well, the last visit Mrs. Woodstock made in the afternoon about a week ago, someone telephoned and asked for a Mrs. Emil Sprague. My nurse and receptionist called in and asked if Mrs. Sprague could answer the phone. Was the nurse Miss Squire? Uh, no, she had just left me. It was Miss Hall, who didn't know my patients by name. But when Mrs. Woodstock heard the name Sprague, she went into hysterics. I gave her a sedative. When she was calmed, I wanted to ask about what had happened, but, well, I didn't. There was something about her that begged me not to. I decided to wait until she came back, but she never did. Well, so it's Amol Sprague now. I, I'm sorry I was hesitant, Mr. Dollar. Well, it's a 
in the works now. We'll see what we can make out of it. How's Mrs. Woodstock? Still alive. Those chest things are bad, though. Here's how the shooting stacks up so far. She was wounded by 38 caliber slugs. Her husband was killed by 32s. So if you were right on your gun description, the man you ran into killed her husband. Now, what does that leave us? Woodstock killing his wife? Well, he was shot from behind while he was going into the upstairs room, apparently chased up there. He had a gun in his hand that he dropped when he was hit. That was the gun we found on the floor, the thirty-eight caliber. Ballistics hasn't run any comparison tests yet. No, not yet. I'll let you know as soon as we get a report. Close to 12 that night, the lieutenant phoned me that Mrs. Woodstock was finally responding to treatment and would likely live. I was at the hospital at 12.30, but it wasn't until almost 3 that Lieutenant Jester and I were told that Mrs. Woodstock was conscious and able to answer questions. Mrs. Woodstock. Are you feeling better? Uh, my name is Lieutenant Jester, and this is Mr. Dollar. Mm. We're both interested in what happened at your house the other evening. Mrs. Woodstock, do you understand what we're saying to you? Do you understand? My husband, Lyle, they told me he was all right. Is he? Well, uh, he was shot. Did they tell you that? Yes. Do you know who did it? Yes, I know. I was there. I remember. We wish you'd tell us, Mrs. Woodstock. Emil Sprague? Yes. Yes, Emil. No one else was there. He made me go. Made you go where? To my house. Talk to my husband. Emil Sprague made you go? Why? How could he make you go? Because I'm Mrs. Emil. You're Mrs. Emil Sprague? You were married to Sprague. Your marriage to him was never ended, but you married Woodstock anyway. Yes. I was wrong. I lied. I didn't tell him. Then it was money. He wanted money. Sprague did. Yes. I didn't know where he was in Mexico. I had to get away. And I married my husband. That's all it matters. I'm afraid it isn't. Sprague followed you here. In Florida. I begged him not to. That $2,000 you drew from your bank. I gave it to him. But it wasn't enough. He made me stay with him. He made me... Go with him for more money. And my husband. I tried to make him understand. He wouldn't. He'd blame me. Call me things. Went to the drawer. Why didn't he shoot him? Did it me? Are you sure of that? Woodstock shot you? Going to the drawer. I remember. Turning around with a gun. That's all. Huh. Do you know where Sprague would go? Back to Florida. Well, we don't think so. We've got a good description of him and the car he was driving. We think he's still in Bridgeport someplace. You said you were with him. Where? We had a room on Commercial Street 713. Is it a rooming house? No, a big building. An apartment. Which one is Sprague's? It's number 12 on the second floor. Does he have a phone in the room? Yes. Elmwood 42132. Thank you. We uh, won't bother you anymore. Thanks, Mrs. Goodson. I want to help my husband. I'll do anything I can. I want you to know that. We'll tell it, Mrs. Woodstock. Lieutenant. The men should be set at the back of the building. All right, Sergeant. You'll go in with me. It's that corner room up there. There's a door to another room right across from his, so we want to keep him from firing if we can. All right, let's go across. Good luck. Lieutenant! 
The window. He's onto us. He's been watching at the window. I saw him move. The devil. Well, we better see what you can do on the phone then, Dollar. Phone? We thought if you couldn't catch him off guard, we'd try and talk him out. And there's a pay phone in the hallway. Just to the right at the top of the stairs there. That phone is right in line from up there. Now we'll cover it. Okay, Dollar, if you're ready. got a complete statement from Mrs. Woodstock. Your blackmail, the works. She's alive? Yeah, she's gonna make it. I thought she was dead. I saw her fall. I killed him because I thought she was dead. If I'd have known, I wouldn't have killed him. I should have found out. You should have done a lot of things. What we want you to do right now is give yourself up without any trouble. Every door in the building is covered by police. We want you to come out of your room and down the stairs with your hands out where we can see them. Do you understand that? Are you listening to me? Come on, Sprague. Come on out and make it easy the for... The stairs. Look Get out! Get down, Dollar! Stay there, Sergeant. Be careful. It's all right. Sprague? Sprague? He's dead, Lieutenant. Sergeant? Yes, sir? I'll go phone in. Keep the people away as best you can. Expense account item two, $45, miscellaneous. Hotel, meals, etc. Expense account total, $73.60. Remarks? I understand the lawyers for the Woodstock estate are already measuring ways and means to cut the bigamous wife out of the estate. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Victor Rodman, Ken Christie, Virginia Gregg, Bill Conrad, Edgar Barrier, and Jim Nusser. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. Well, it's good uh, for Johnny to get some chance to observe some... uh, positive actions taken by uh, humanity in the midst of the muck he's going through. Um, this episode, uh, for those of you who've been long-time listeners, was uh, run previously. Uh, the episode we heard today was recorded in Jan- January 1954. It first ran March the 3rd, 1951, and we played it here March 4th of uh, 2011. Uh, so by so when it first ran, the whole blood donation had uh, a significance of uh, helping the American war effort in Korea. But it was still left in, uh, it's just this rare moment to, for a guy who's constantly coming on uh, people who are ne'er-do-wells, uh, experiencing some folks doing something good. And this was... Uh, Interesting to hear, uh, for me, just because it was the, uh, listened to it the day before my scheduled trip down to the Red Cross. So, 
Um, well, that will actually do it for today. Uh, if you have a comment, email it to me, box13greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and give us a call, 208-991-4783. We will be back on Monday with the Adventures of Frank Race, and then join us back here on Friday for another episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.